Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Andy Wilson Thompson, and I'm a senior policy analyst at New America's Open Technology Institute. Uh, OTI works at the intersection of technology and policy to ensure that every community has equitable access to digital technology and its benefits. We promote universal access to communications technologies that are both open and secure using a multidisciplinary approach that brings together advocates, researchers, organizers, and innovators. The folks at Scoop News Group graciously invited us to hold a community event as part of IT Mod Week. Based on work that OTI has done on Internet of Things security and evaluation, and based on the National Institute of Standards and Technology's recent work on IoT labeling, we thought this would be a perfect opportunity to pull together an event on the next steps for getting an IoT label onto shelves. As part of his cybersecurity executive order last year, President Biden asked NIST to identify IoT cybersecurity criteria for a consumer labeling program, to initiate pilot programs informed by existing consumer product labeling programs, and to consider ways to incentivize manufacturers and developers to participate in these programs. For those of us who have worked on issues surrounding consumer privacy and security, especially the risks caused by the proliferation of IoT devices, this is a big opportunity to address the often poor security practices of companies that produce these devices with some kind of nutrition label, trust mark, or evaluation metric that would help consumers have more confidence in the devices that they are purchasing and incentivize manufacturers to implement best practices in consumer IoT security and privacy. Today, we are joined by three experts who can help us discuss the next steps in this process, the need for some kind of label in this space, and the ways that civil society and other entities can collaborate to help get a label out into the world. Um, I'd like to introduce today's panelists. Uh, I'll be moderating the panel. Uh, then my colleagues, um, Kat Megas is the NIST IoT Cybersecurity Program Manager. She is responsible for coordinating across NIST on work related to advancing the state of cybersecurity and the Internet of Things. Nat Meisenberg is a technologist at New America's Open Technology Institute, focusing on tech security privacy issues, including research into the IoT security landscape and testing standards. And Justin Brookman is the Director of Technology Policy at Consumer Reports, where he focuses on issues of privacy, security, competition, and platform accountability. Kat, could you give us a little bit of a background on the goals of the NIST process, where it stands now, and how you envision it being implemented? Great, thank you. Um, thank you for having me here. Um, I think before I jump into the work on the executive order, I'd like to just kind of touch on a little bit of the cybersecurity for IoT program at NIST because uh, it is a program that's been around for about five years now. And a lot of the work we did in the previous five years actually were uh, used and were built on in advancing kind of the work we were assigned by President Biden under the current executive order. Um, so, so going back to kind of the beginning of the program, we started tackling the problem, how can we improve the state of the internet of things? Um, and we looked at existing tools like the cybersecurity framework, the risk management framework. Um, what did organizations have today to manage their IoT risks? And uh, one of the things that became evident to us was there seemed to be kind of this disconnect in the world between the organizations that were buying or the people who were using IoT devices and the folks who were producing and building the IoT devices. Um, there, was, there, there was a little bit of what seemed like a mismatch and expectations across the two. Um, and that's when we said, right, I think we could actually provide value in this space where we could build a bridge between the organizations that were building IoT devices and then the users or the consumers or the customers of these IoT devices. Um, Right around that time, Executive Order 13800 happened, and in the report that Department of Commerce and DHS jointly uh, drafted and submitted to the White House, IoT devices were kind of identified as a, as a key uh, nexus of, of threats for the Internet. Um, so as such, NIST embarked on an effort saying, right, now that we know we need to focus on IoT and IoT is a, is a critical area for the nation, um, where do we start? So we opted to start with what we call a core baseline, which is uh, listening to stakeholders who said, you know, fragmentation is, is not good for the market. Can we first identify where, where can we all agree as a common baseline across all 
IoT devices. We understand that there's going to be differences needed for critical infrastructure, federal government, for um, perhaps other applications that are non-governmental and consumer, but where can we agree? And so we developed this core baseline. It's called 8259. Um, it's been out there for a while, and, and, and we've actually seen a lot of support for 8259. Coming out of that work, we started working on implementing the IoT Cybersecurity Improvement Act of 2020, which took that core baseline and adapted it to the federal government and saying, all right, well, if the federal government is the customer, how do we need to adopt and adapt the core baseline for the federal government as the customer. And then we kind of get to today, which is talking about 14.028 and the executive order there. And again, we said, well, why don't we start with the core baseline again and recognize that the consumer is the customer is different, but how do we need to adapt it? Because the consumer uh, is probably a different sort of customer than the federal government. Um, so that was kind of the first pivot point, And that was our, our starting point. Um, Thank you for like reiterating what we were um, what we were tasked with doing under the executive order. I do want to highlight, um, and we've we've said this in in our blogs and most of our workshops. We do not intend on standing up a program at NIST. What we were actually intending to do is articulate the desirable attributes of a labeling scheme. Um, we are hoping that this is uh, going to be something that is going to be able to take advantage of existing programs out there. So rather than NIST establishing the program, what we're hoping to do is, is articulate what are the outcomes, and then hopefully we'll, we'll see the market respond to that. Um, so the, the ways that we like to talk about the labeling scheme, and I'll kind of organize it this way to keep myself organized as well, we talk about the criteria. The criteria are kind of the things that we expect the manufacturer to do and, and, and what we expect the product to do or the manufacturer to do in support of that product cybersecurity. The second area we kind of focused on was um, how should the manufacturer demonstrate conformity, right? Is it self-declared? Is it something done through some third party? And then, of course, the last part is the label. What should the label look like? Um, to convey to the consumer the information about the device and what the, the cybersecurity of the device is. Um, so going back to kind of the criteria, which is the area that I, I was very focused on because that was my team's background and, and kind of my background, um, there were a couple of pivot points in our thinking. Um, one was when we said, all right, now we are talking about the consumer as the customer, we're not talking about an enterprise customer. We're not talking about the federal government as a customer. Um, how are they going to look at the device? And um, we also looked at kind of the, the, the landscape review of other efforts out there. And we decided we needed to look at the products holistically and not just the device. Because your average consumer, when they buy a device, um, they're buying a product. They're, they're buying a device on a shelf, but they're actually getting everything that comes with delivering that smart functionality or the smart features, whether it be the cloud, whether it be the back end. Sometimes it's the mobile app uh, that it's on your mobile device that actually controls the, the, um, the device. So we decided to take our core baseline and we decided to adapt that to include the entire product. Um, the other kind of pivot point in what we did as well, going from our recommendation for a core baseline is um, we started looking at elaborating requirements. We started looking at what was already out there, what standards already existed. Um, and as we started working through the process, um, we did, uh, we put out uh, a draft, we invited public comments, we held a workshop, uh, and we were receiving comments. And we tried to be very cognizant of the feedback we were getting and articulate requirements. But as we began to articulate requirements, we realized the more specific we became about requirements, the more brittle those requirements became and unlikely to be able to keep up with the rapidly changing you know, landscape of whether it be threats or whether it be device functionality and as well as trying to do something across all of IoT, even if it's just consumer. Um, consumer IoT devices take so many different flavors from um, you know, very sophisticated and very capable down to your very constrained device, constrained in terms of power and bandwidth and uh, processing power. Um, so that's when we pivoted to what we call outcome-based. Um, 
And the picture we like to paint when we talk about outcome-based criteria is um, what we try to do is articulate what are the outcomes for cybersecurity that we want the device to achieve. How that outcome is achieved is likely going to have to be fulfilled by multiple standards because you're trying to fulfill a large landscape of requirements. And also we think standards are likely to be able to keep up and evolve more quickly um, than any sort of brittle requirements that we could have created. Um, so if you, if you kind of look at the picture that we, we like to paint, um, at the very top, we kind of talk about outcomes. In the middle, we talk about all the standards and specifications that are likely to kind of backfill and establish a more articulate or more detailed description of how to meet the outcomes. And then at the very bottom is, are the devices that are going to, or the device manufacturers or product manufacturers who are going to have to um, either uh, self-attest through some sort of self-declaration or either use some sort of third-party uh, certification to meet those requirements. Um, in addition, when we talk about the label, um, we didn't go into any sort of specificity about the label other than uh, making a recommendation for it to be um, layered and that it be binary. Um, this was based on kind of our uh, experts assessment and research that we've done and uh, what was likely for us to, to um, be something that a average consumer would be able to understand. Um, the idea behind a layered uh, label would be that the actual device, the first kind of layer of information for the consumer is kind of a yes, no, the device either does it or the device does not. For those more sophisticated individuals um, that might want more information, whether you're a repairman or whether potentially you are kind of a very tech savvy, cybersecurity savvy, savvy consumer, you would be able to go to this layer that would be digital and actually find a lot more information about what the device does. Um, so that being said, I'll try to kind of like wrap it up to like kind of where we are right now. And we're right in the middle of kind of the next steps. Um, we published in February what we kind of see as our final recommendations based on the white papers, based on workshops, comments received, uh, landscape review. Um, now that these recommendations are out there, we've invited what we are calling uh, contributions, where we are asking, whether it be the market, stakeholders, to um, provide us with contributions to help inform this kind of pilot phase where we're piloting the, the concept of what this labeling scheme could look like, um, whether it be that you have an existing program, you have existing specifications or standards, how those relate to the outcomes that we've already published, um, all the way through um, giving us contributions, discussing what are potential incentives uh, that you see would be needed in order for this sort of scheme or the sort of concept that we're piloting in our, in our white paper. Um, give us your feedback. What are the incentives that are needed? You know, who would undertake those incentives? Where could they come from? Um, any sort of information that would be helpful to us in completing kind of this report uh, that's due to the White House in May. Um, so I did not start my timer, Andy, but uh, I probably talked a bit more than my five minutes. Thanks. Thanks, Kat. No, it's very helpful to get a view of, you know, how this process has gone and what the background is. I'm not sure that people are necessarily super up on that. Um, and so it's very helpful to sort of inform our discussion. Uh, I wanted to move to Nat. Um, you know, civil society and security experts have been sort of sounding the alarm about the risks of IoT devices for years, uh, especially as many manufacturers who used to make sort of dumb products start to connect their new products to the internet. Could you talk a little bit about why an effort to label devices is so important right now and some of the risks of continuing on um, as we have until this point? Sure. Um, so, so to start with, the uh, landscape of IoT security has historically been pretty bad. When we talk about I I IoT, let's just step back and think about like the kind of broad range of things we're talking about because it is everything from the lock on your front door to TVs, uh, phones on desks. I've been thinking a lot personally about the kind of uh, close nexus of things that, are, that have ostensibly been like home use or consumer goods that are 
inextricably also kind of office goods, um, TVs being, smart TVs being a primary example because uh, you can't build a modern conference room without a television, without a big TV on the wall. And you can't find a big TV that isn't also a smart TV. So it's a, br a broad range of products. And historically, the uh, life cycles of these products are so short and so fast um, that the how to secure them has, has been an afterthought because the incentives have just been like poorly aligned. Um, and this has led to a situation where you can buy a product uh, like a, a baby monitor and have no idea um, exactly like what services it interacts with in, uh, or you can, um, and you know, there's count countless examples of, of just like hacked IoT devices that, that come up in the news. Um, you know, and everything happens from leaking your personal data to the ability to get onto your network and get to other devices. Or in the cases of TVs, a modern TV also has a camera and a microphone. So uh, we're talking about a lot, a lot of the ability to capture uh, several kinds of very sensitive and personal data. Um, and this is really an issue both in the home context and uh, in office context, government purchasing co uh, contexts uh, by extension, um, and uh, and when you and then there's a whole range of other like smart devices for the office uh, from the phone uh, modern uh, voice over IP phones to even things like uh, the smart coffee makers um, and. So labeling would be uh, and, a, and a standardized testing framework behind it would, uh, is a useful first step in being able to give consumers the kind, uh, and purchasers the kind of information they need about whether the product can meet a, a minimum baseline requirement. And uh, we've, we have these kinds of labels all over, you know, there's the ubiquitous nutrition label on food, um, but like we have Energy Star on other electronics, we have uh, LEED for buildings, um, and all of these are certification schemes that just allow people to at a glance kind of have some knowledge that this product meets a baseline set of tested standards. Um, labeling IoT isn't new either. Um, in 2020, uh, Singapore uh, uh, started requiring IoT products, uh, certain classes of IoT products to uh, adhere to labeling standards. And in 2021, they, uh, Singapore and Finland uh, bilaterally agreed to cross honor each other's testing. Or in other words, Finland uh, took Singapore's uh, standard and adopted it as its own. And now, if a product gets tested for the Finnish market, it is considered tested for the Singapore market and vice versa. Um, and so, yeah, and so, so also in the consumer tech um, kind of adjacent to security labeling, uh, France has implemented a uh, repairability index law, which requires uh, tech product manufacturers to similarly uh, report how the how they uh, adhere to a set of standards uh, on being able to repair electronics. Um, so these so major international IoT product vendors are already conforming to these kinds of standards in other markets, and so these kinds of labels uh, have the potential to kind of push the entire industry in a better direction. They just need, the wider the adoption and the, the more the consumer demand and the more ways we can induce that consumer demand, the more we can hope that that, that kind of baseline standard will find its way everywhere over the next five, 10 years. Thanks, Nat. Uh, Justin, so as part of Consumer Reports, 
efforts to educate consumers about the products that they can purchase. Uh, your digital lab has taken a close look at some verticals of IoT products and provided reviews. Uh, as a consumer advocate yourself, what issues do you think need to be considered as part of the discussion around a new labeling scheme? Yeah, I think it's the, the key issue is it's, it's really um, difficult to impossible for consumers to make security conscious decisions today. You, you, you look at the, the marketplace, you just don't have any information available to you. Um, in theory, like it, 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 legally, everything should have some degree of baseline security. Um, the Federal Trade Commission, um, which enforces the general purpose consumer protection statute, has said that its um, prohibition on unfair business practices means companies are legally required to use reasonable security to safeguard data. Um, and the good news is they brought 80 cases against companies for, for violating that. Um, the bad news is they brought 80 cases and there's like 8 zillion products out there. Um, and so there's obviously been not been enough deterrent effect to get a lot of companies to even implement the most rudimentary of, of, of schemes. Um, also, about half the states have some sort of data security requirements. California has a, a dedicated cybersecurity law. Um, again, though, because of lack of resources, lack of enforcement, lack of technology expertise and regulators, um, they just haven't been able to put enough fear of God into, into companies um, or enough companies to, to move the marketplace to a place where consumers can reasonably expect that things will operate safely. And so I think as, as Nat was saying, um, it, it is a little bit of a, of a wild west. If you um, um, ever attend the Consumer Electronics Show uh, in, in Las Vegas and there's all these new IoT devices and you go to a booth and ask them about data, you know, <laughs> uh, data security or how long will this product be supported, they look at, like you're talking a, a different language. Um, similarly, Amazon right amazon um, now a third-party marketplace you can buy tons and tons of stuff from tons of tons of different vendors often of, um, um often have no idea who, who's actually manufacturing it a lot of this stuff is cheap and manufactured overseas which is great that it's cheap and that's a, that's a real benefit to consumers um but perhaps safety and security and other issues have not been accounted for there's no you know testing regime there's um even 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 maybe even fewer requirements here um in some cases that can lead to real danger. Um, hoverboards is a kind of famous example on, on, on Amazon. People buy these hoverboards for Christmas. Um, there, there's no safety protocols in place. Um, and then the, the house catches fire. Um, and similar like you know, on data security, there's this, um, you know, it, when you buy something on Amazon, there's no reasonable basis to, to expect um, that security is baked into a product. Um, I think um, even beside, I mean, I think the other issue that's interesting is support period, right? So you buy a device, how long is the company going to like provide security updates? Because security for connected devices is not a one-time thing. It's not like you set security and then it's done. Like you have, to, you have to do security updates. You have to like dedicate resources to looking for bugs and finding them um, and then patching them. Um, and that's that takes money. That's like, that's something companies don't aren't thrilled about doing. Um, and so there's just not a lot of real clear expectations today for IoT products. And again, because of lack of enforcement, maybe maybe your expectations are that, that it's not going to be done. Um, I think about <clears throat> desktop oper operating systems. Like you know, you, know, you get uh, updates every month. It's very well expected. Uh, 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 operating systems are updated for years and years and years, um, and people generally don't have, um, like, like Microsoft Vista was uh, supported until a couple of years ago. And so that's a place where people do have reasonable expectations. Um, mobile phones is a lot dodgier, right? I mean, some phones like Apple's, ten, uh, Apple's iPhone tends to get supported for a, a, a very long period of time. Android phones, the practices are all over the map. Um, I, when I was at the FTC, we did a study of these of these systems, and some phones, like get, you know, get get they, they promise support periods for three years, and maybe they'll support them for five. Others, like you know, expensive flagship phones, come out of the box insecure and never get a, a, a patch. Um, and then I, and, and IoT is even even worse. Like you get you buy a smart TV, how long do you expect? Is going to get security updates. How long are they going to support the apps that are on there? There's just no real meeting of the minds, and people don't really know what they're getting. They buy something, but they don't really think about what the the down um, downstream cost could be. So that's one place I think a, a label could be really helpful. If like you buy a product and it says this will be good for five years, um, that this will this will be received security updates for five years. I think a lot of the elements like identified in this framework are really hard for people to wrap their heads around. Like. 
um, I think there's, there's you no know, access controls or, or it's encryption. But they don't really know, um, and it's hard for people to price that. Like, how do I how do I price price server to server uh, you know end end encryption? It's really difficult for people to to assess the tail risk. Um, but like product period, like when I will have to replace this, this product is good for five years versus three years. That's something that a person can and would make an informed market decision. And so I think that's one area that's, that I'm super enthusiastic about that a label could meaningfully convey, convey to someone how long they should expect it to last. Yeah, I have similar been I've been to CES and sort of seen the large areas of the conference room that are like Shenzhen company number and you know they'll show you the light up backpack that connects to your phone and changes colors and if you say does this have a privacy policy they will look at you like you have two heads but it is a very cool backpack that changes colors supposedly based on my mood so i don't know but it is definitely hard especially with those smaller companies or you know one-off device makers or um you know, inexperienced, it, it's, a, it's not hard to connect a product to your phone to connect it to an app to have like fun, cool features, but the risk posed by that um, is challenging and something that just isn't necessarily front of mind for a lot of the manufacturers that make them. Uh, Kat, I wanted to ask you about sort of the layered approach um, that this is something you've promoted. Justin brought up the fact that it is really hard to um, identify things like encryption or you know features that to those of us who work in tech policy are extremely important encryption authentication those kind of things but are hard to visually represent for someone who doesn't know about this right the, the why should you care part is a challenge so could you talk to me a little bit about why you guys decided that it should be a layered approach like sort of trust spark layers versus um a nutrition label, which at least some of the aspects mm -hmm. of the nutrition label are things people understand, like fat calories and kinds of things. Why did you think a layered mm -hmm. approach was the right way to go? Yeah. So um, I don't want to speak for my colleague, Julie Haney, who is our human factors um, lead on a lot of this work. Um, but I but I think as a team, you know, we were we were very much in consensus. Um, and there, there were kind of two schools of thoughts, uh, but we'd also done a couple of workshops. We did a consumer IoT workshop in, oh my gosh, this goes back now to November, not this past November, the previous November of the year before that. And um, we heard very strong feedback at that workshop. And this was even before the executive order was, was kind of on the horizon that your average consumer uh, cannot be expected just like you said to kind of like understand um, what is the importance of encryption how am i going to use encryption the idea as well in iot cybersecurity, right there's also this kind of displacement value proposition um, my device still continues to work for me my device may get compromised may get uh you know uh may get like recruited into a larger kind of botnet attack um, I may be bringing down, you know, potentially third parties like DIN. However, I, as the individual, um, my device still continues to kind of work for me. That being said, though, we did realize that there are people in uh, the environment that might need to understand uh, whether you're a repairman or whether you're some third party or whether you're a security researcher. There were stakeholders that were actually interested in understanding exactly what the device does. Um, so that's kind of where we decided it's, it's really important for us to establish a baseline. Um, all devices, uh, for the most part, should be able to and should meet the baseline. It's, you should either do it or you should not do it. Um, but we did agree that there needed to also be the um, kind of the more information uh, that's, that's put out there. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of curious, I was listening to some of, you know, the other folks speak and I, you know, I'm not sure if everybody could see my head nodding because there was a lot of it I was agreeing with. You know, one of the very first things that came up um, when we uh, kind of kicked off the executive order activities was, um, will a label, do we actually think that a label will change consumer behavior? And, and we received a lot of questions from our stakeholders on that. Um, NIST has done some research, you know, and, and we do, uh, we have seen from our research that at least those, those that do participate, um, they do say, the average consumer does say, I do care about cybersecurity. 
Um, however, we've also seen though in other areas that sometimes consumers say they do care about something, um, but then yes, they get that, that really cool backpack that has the ability to kind of change life depend, depending on my mood and um, you know, who's, who's calling me on my phone. I can tell by the colors flashing on my backpack. And, you know, sometimes in the, in the moment to moment when you're standing at the shelf and you're making actually a purchase decision, um, the intent to actually, you know, care sometimes gets overshadowed by kind of um, decisions about all the cool features. So, you know, I think there's still a lot of questions remaining open about, you know, what will happen. Um, we also say in our paper that we think any sort of specifics about a label would have to be market tested. Uh, we would probably have to get into significant details in this, in this nine months and three month kind of pilot. We didn't have time to get into that level of detail. So we're actually saying whoever is going to potentially take ownership of this scheme, whether it be someone from you know, industry that wants to step up, whether there are a couple of organizations in industry that want to step up and say, you know, this looks like a good approach. We're willing to kind of take it on and, and become a scheme owner. You know, our recommendation would be for the label um, that they would probably have to do some significant market testing to kind of figure out which one would actually change purchasing behavior and be most useful to the consumer. So I'm not proposing that we have the end all be all answer. Um, yeah, I think there's been a lot of research around consumers' positions on privacy. Pew has done some research. And I think part of the question that we all struggle with is how much do you care, right? You know, you ask, oh, do you care that your product is encrypted? And people say, yeah, that sounds great. But the question is, do you care enough to buy a product that is encrypted over a product that is not encrypted, right? You know, these, these ideas that privacy and security are important sort of translate, but does it overcome the cool flashing lights, the fact that this product seems very interesting, the how much is always a question throughout public policy in general, but definitely when it comes to privacy and security. Um, sort of on that, Justin, I actually wanted to ask you, uh, you know, we, uh, Consumer Reports has a project called the Digital Standard, which is a set of metrics around security and privacy that you review connected products on. Um, we've worked with you on that. And often what I was told by companies is the carrot for them for adhering to these best practices was getting a great rating from Consumer Reports. And so CR being independent from companies and from government has that great sort of market impact like carrot stick approach um, that has been extremely successful for you, for you and people in my family and i know you know if you're going to buy a car you look at the consumer reports listing how have you found that rating companies and rating products can incentivize like adherence to best practices yeah it's something that we've done for oh, about five or so years now yeah we announced a digital standard which is kind of like i articulate that their criteria is yeah, you don't share data you don't need to you don't collect data, you don't need to um, we've been evaluating um, a, a dozen or more, I should, I should know, sorry, uh, of product lines on those criteria um, and give them scores uh, about, you know, this company. And again, um, you know, it's tricky because you can't actually see a lot of it, right? Um, um, so like, you know, if there's data sharing going on in the background, like, you know, from their their servers to someone else's, like we can't see that. And so that's very, uh, same with security, right? If they're using encryption on, on, their, on, on their, their servers, um, that's not observable to, to us. Um, another challenge is like, you know, um, um, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, uh, Oh, sorry, the, the, the practices can change. Sorry, <laughs> um, like you know, they, they can just you know uh, turn turn a switch, and then and then uh, um, uh, so, so suddenly the behaviors are wildly different. Um, there's also lots and lots and lots and lots of products. Like I said, like you know, on Amazon now, you're not choosing between ten televisions; you're choosing between a hundred different models from you know thirty different uh, manufacturers. Um, so it's really tricky. Um, I think you know we have done some analyses to see whether it doesn't you know, change buying decisions. Uh, we did a conjoint analysis to see what, whether people do change their behaviors based on it. And like, you know, they, they say they do. Um, you know, they say they're willing to pay more for a premium. It's really hard to see in practice um, whether, they, whether they do or not. We don't have the visibility into that, but I think people, we've gotten good feedback that people appreciate the, the information. Um, you know, in security, I think Kat makes a really good point that there are externalities that, you know, that you, that you don't price, right? My computer may be um, spamming people around the world. And maybe I don't care. I don't. I don't really bear the cost of that, and so I don't really. I'm not incentivized to take enough action um, on it. Also, people are really bad at calculating tail risk, right? That's like the very small chance of something really bad happening. People just 
don't calculate that, which is why we mandate seat belts, right? That's why we mandate airbags. Um, don't make, you know, people will make an informed choice, like I'm gonna pay extra for the airbags or not. No, as a society, we need to make the decision to do it. And I think for security, a lot of it's gonna have to be that. Um, we're gonna have to mandate certain things. And then some things, maybe the margins, um, maybe like you know how long product, products will be supported or something that they're gonna have to, um, maybe that's the place people can make informed decisions. Yeah, we all, you know, really want security and privacy to be an important factor for consumers. We all spend a lot of time trying to convince people that it is important, but ultimately it is hard both to get people to make decisions based on those sort of more amorphous things and also to measure whether that's how they're making decisions. Uh, you know, I'm, I want to talk about mandates a little bit later, but Nat, one of the things that I think is a challenge with labeling is, you know, we live in a country with big tech companies, companies that make a lot of these products that are very powerful when it comes to political lobbying and companies don't love being regulated, right? Like labels often require some sort of push to be popular, but I know there are also a lot of barriers to a labeling scheme, um, not just for large companies, but for smaller companies that produce products that are available to consumers. Could you talk about some of the sort of more technical or logistical barriers to implementing labels? Sure. <laughs> um... First of all, like the just doing any kind of product testing is placing more time between when I make a thing and when I can sell the thing. So it, you know the and and that's for any any safety testing, any product testing is just going to take some time. You need people to do that testing. So in the as I so you're going to need at companies at a certain scale are going to need to do this in-house and then smaller companies are going to need to rely on like external provi uh, providers to do these things um, and that is time and money um, and there's a lot of uh, other, other issues by the that get introduced by the way the ecosystem is just structured so um, I was reading uh, about a Vulnerability that uh, last year uh, that that was uh, announced by Cisco in their IP phones, so like the phones on people's desks, where um, Cisco did all they could do to patch the vulnerability, but the problem was partially the software on the phone and partially the chip in about eight different model series, and and until. Broadcom, the maker of the chip, did something about it, the uh, vulnerability, which I couldn't find whether or not Broadcom has even patched this vulnerability, that these phones are less vulnerable than they were last summer, but there's still that vulnerability sitting there because of the like downstream effect. And this is Cisco and Broadcom, like two of the like largest players in this field who are having trouble getting this kind of coordination, right? And so there's just like, I mean, the, the disincentives to do this abound. And like, I, I, I often say to people in, you know, my career doing technology, nobody ever asked me to slow it down to make it more secure. Like that was just never an, in, like, and that, that has brought all kinds of problems up and down the ecosystem and, and, that is why you get the pushback to this label because it's, it's kind of one of the things we're trying to do is backfill decades of inattentiveness and like these kinds of re reflexive responses built around that inattentiveness. Um, and so there's, yeah, there, uh, there's a lot of pushback there. But I think that, that when, when talking about the, the disincentives, I, I, I also like to think about like, well, what are the what are the the ways that we can actually like reduce the pain of doing this uh, as like the, the the groups of people who who might be doing doing the testing or making the standards and i think one of the ways to do that is kind of linking these kinds of outcomes in testing standards to how uh technical standards shared technical standards get developed so if you can develop you know, the kind of IoT analog to 
you know, a, a wide known internet standard like HTTP or something like that. If you can get all of the makers to say, we're gonna use this one standard for pushing updates out to IoT devices, then that gives everyone who's testing something to say, is that standard implemented or not? And if it is implemented properly, we can make all of these various assumptions about its security properties. And, um, but that doesn't really exist. It's just next to impossible to find out what's even running on a lot of these chips. So having the, 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 the testing and labeling standard will also require just a lot more information. The fact that it requires more information sharing is just so really important because when you go looking, you know, how do I know what chip is in my random IP camera that I bought on Amazon for $30? Yeah, I think that's one of the things we've struggled with when testing, but is a feature of um, the Internet of Things in general, is there are so many different components that interact for each of these devices, whether it's the operating system they run, the chips that they use, um, shared code, uh, a lot of them have an app or they interact with an app that maybe controls multiple different kinds of devices. They might have a relationship with Amazon or Google or one, you know, another um, connect to Alexa. It's so many different pieces that make up sort of the security landscape of an individual device. And that makes it really challenging to test. It makes it really challenging to evaluate, um, but it also introduces a lot of security risks that um, you know, aren't the case for something that is like a, a dumb product, for something that has a much more simple structure and way of interacting with other devices and with users. Um, Nat, did you have something you wanted to circle back I on? I just wanted to, uh, to, to build on, on what you were saying there, because I think that one of the things I really like about the, the NIST criteria and guidelines is the, um, the, that kind of broad ecosystem full functionality definition of what constitutes a device. So it's, it's the device and the server and you know the cloud infrastructure. Because like one example of why I think it's like so important from the kind of testing we've done is uh, we're, we were testing a baby monitor and I found that the baby monitor was every 15, 20 minutes, uh, just sending a little data packet to a uh, server in Beijing. And I did a bunch of digging um, from, from what I can tell, the company, this server that it was connecting to is a company that runs an IoT control cloud service. And one of the services it offers IoT makers is a way to like locate a device on the internet. So technically, like so to think about why you need this technically, if I have my my phone out in the world and I want to look at the camera feed from the baby monitor, the app needs some way to find where in the world my home internet connection is and broker that connection between where in the world my phone is. And so there's so there does need to be something that's that's saying, hey, here I am. Um, that's like a completely feasible technical requirement to making a smart baby monitor do the thing that you bought it to do. But without any kind of labeling or disclosure requirements, like I don't know that that's the data that's being sent to the uh, to the uh, server in Beijing. There's no like standard like datagram protocol that I could inspect to say like, oh yeah, all it's doing is sending its serial number to a server. Um, but there's, you know, all, all I can tell you is that it was periodically sending a consistent data packet to Beijing and that's it. I can't tell you what, and everything else is speculation. And I think that yeah, having uh, having that that kind of information disclosure requirement would make that process easier to test and label and standardize as just one just really concrete example from the world. Yeah, I think that's part of the challenge is sort of the black box nature of a lot of these devices is unless a company explains to us, you know, what they are doing in each of these cases, it's very hard as an external testing organization, especially when some companies are hostile to external testing, to be able to truly understand 
anything beyond what they tell us and what is immediately visible, right? Like I can look at a privacy policy and they can tell me that they only disclose information in certain cases, but that's all I've got. And that I think is one of the interesting things about when companies have to get involved in their own testing, when they might need to self-test to a standard, when they might be a collaborative actor as part of this versus an external organization imposing testing upon them. There's some sort of cooperative nature that means, you know, they might be asked exactly what information is being sent on that ping. Is it something innocuous or is it something that consumers might find concerning? Because we were unable to actually figure that out. Um, Kat, I wanted to talk a little bit. So we all have very strong opinions about what this should look like and very strong opinions about IoT testing in general and the importance. Um, but I know the way that NIST has been working on this, you have sort of left some open-ended components of needing uh, someone to implement this. Um, you know, it, it it stops at a certain point and you need sort of a scheme manager, um, you know, where where do you see sort of civil society, external experts collaborating on that kind of next steps? Like, what do you need from those of us with strong opinions in order to help get this on shelves? So, well, um, first of all, I will not get ahead of um, the White House since really we are on the hook to deliver the report to the White House. After that, I think it is really going to be up to them to kind of decide what is what is meaningful and what, what makes sense for the next steps. Um, I think right now getting those contributions, whether it be to say, to stand up and say, hey, um, I may not have a program currently, but I am interested in standing up and, and stepping up and maybe being a scheme owner. And perhaps you wanna be a scheme owner for a certain you know, type of consumer device. Um, maybe you are interested in saying, look, I, I, I think there might likely be multiple scheme owners out there. Uh, they could potentially all step in. But one thing we've also made as a recommendation is understanding the consumer. Um, even if there's multiple schemes and each scheme is, is, is perhaps organized around a product type, there probably might need to be somebody that steps into the role of being, uh, let's say, the label governance and saying, right, um, I don't actually run the laboratories myself. I don't actually pick and choose which ones are the standards. Um, but I do kind of manage the process to ensure that only products that have satisfied the requirements or that are participating in one of the scheme owners uh, is actually putting this label on and then doing all the market surveillance that goes along with, with um, the labeling. So um, I think right now we are looking to draw on kind of the, the collective brainstorming of the community um, to say, hey, here is, here is either a role we would like to play or here's some ideas we have on how um, this could work or here are some specific steps that you could take, um, that the government could take to actually help close some of the gaps we see between where the market currently is and where existing conformity assessment programs are. And you know, here's some gaps, but here's some ideas about how we can close the gaps. So it's a little bit of an open-ended question we have for you all right now, um, but that's because we really um, want to not constrain the responses that we get. Um, so hopefully we'll hear from uh, everybody, I think, uh, because we do have kind of an early May deadline and, and, you know, we have our own processes once we actually draft the report to get it through before we can actually deliver it. Um, we are asking to hear back from folks by mid-April. Um, so that is quickly coming up, um, I'm sorry, mid-March, mid-March. April, we want to actually already have the report pretty much on its way and through the approval process. So mid-March. Um, so there is still time. There's, there's still a couple of weeks out there, but um, hopefully we will hear back. Um, I think generally even early on before this executive order started, um, I used to get a lot of questions from stakeholders about, you know, what's the government going to do? Is the government going to stand up a program? I think generally we think uh, the likelihood of something being uh, sustainable in the long term is really when it's driven by market need or by market demand, um, wherever that might come from. And, and um, so rather than it be kind of a top-down approach, we always think that a bottom-up bottom, bottom up is better um, because if there's a demonstrated market need, you're obviously going to find a way to continue to sustain the, the label and the effort. Whereas um, if it's really top-down driven, um, that's usually not the best way for, for things to 
exist. So um, hopefully we'll have people who will respond over the next couple of weeks and say, yeah, you know, we, we would be really interested in playing a role and we are going to provide that information in our report to the White House and we'll leave it up to them to determine what the next steps are. Um, I have questions from the audience, but I just want to raise one more question based on what Kat had said, and this might be a question for Justin. Um, you know, we talk about market need, but also there are things like mandates or regulatory enforcement of standards, you know, although we would very much like things to be voluntary and, you know, stakeholders, including companies who create these products to be on board, there is discussion about whether some sort of forcing function might be necessary to get this standing up, some sort of requirement. And I know you were previously in a regulatory government capacity. I wonder if you have thoughts on the necessity of sort of having a forcing function, having some kind of mandate or requirement, and if you think that that might help um, move things forward or at least hold certain um, you know, companies accountable. Because sort of in both Finland and Singapore, there has been a, you know sort of more of a requirement than we're currently looking at in the States. Yeah, I mean, I think, like I said, there already is a requirement, I think. Um, the FCC has said, you thou shalt use reasonable security as legally required. It hasn't been super tested in the courts. So I think clarifying, you know, Congress clarifying it, the FTC doing a rulemaking saying maybe a little more concreteness, a little more specificity could be valuable. Um, but I think funding is probably the next, next biggest piece um, in the Build Back Better bill, there is provisions to give the FTC a ton more money. Again, they, like, they have 50 people in the privacy and security group right now to do all of privacy and security, which is way, way, way underfunded. So they need to be um, a lot bigger if, um, so they can bring cases and also to deliver more um, informal guidance or maybe formal guidance. And then you know they need to hire technologists in addition to lawyers. Um, I was the FTC, we were in a very small wing called the Office of Technology Research and Investigation, but we were like a hand, like less than 10, fewer than 10 people. Um, and again, supporting all across um, um, other, other divisions within um, the Bureau of Consumer Protection. So they, they just need a ton more uh, technologists in order to kind of, you know, bring these cases or to kind of articulate what the standard should be uh, in order to give, you know, set, set clearer rules for the road than currently exist. Yeah, I think there's always a capacity issue in government and always a capacity issue in general. But um, I agree, you know, the role of technologists in sort of these regulatory discussions is really important. Um, you know, that kind of expertise. I'm not a lawyer. We have lots of excellent policy lawyers, but there, there is a sort of contribution that is necessary. And, uh, you know, I, I appreciate when government agencies show a recognition of sort of that role and that contribution being important to these discussions. Um, Nat, I want to raise one more thing and then I'm gonna move into some questions. So ultimately in other countries where labeling schemes have been st stood up, a lot of the same products that we use in the United States are being used, right? We, we've seen that, you know, if the computer that I purchase is being purchased in another country, if, if these devices are, um, required to have some sort of labeling scheme somewhere else, you know, all of these big companies who would probably not be thrilled with a mandate in America are already held to that kind of requirement. How does that work? Um, you know, do you think that's something where that kind of testing could be a reciprocal arrangement in the same way it has between uh, in, in that situation? I mean, I think there's lots of examples of uh, labeling schemes and like standards meeting where, where you see uh, market moving. Uh, one really great example is uh, the California emission standards and the way the entire auto industry in the US shapes itself around that. Um, I mean, I mean and there's just there and there's weird little pockets li uh, like that, where, where the where you have places where there, there's outsized influence on a market force that can shape the contents of products and i i think that yeah with the uh <laughs> with with iot there's uh, and with, with with tech stuff i mean once dell is you know filling out the paperwork for how repairable one of their laptops is in france they could in theory just start doing it for all of their models um they already have the systems in place to do those things so certainly like companies that are already meeting the the singapore standards 
are, are certainly already well positioned to start meeting new standards. And I think one of the one of the things that is is uh, hopeful pot potential for future work or, or or thing is like moving towards the like har harmonizing of those standards or at least finding the Venn diagram of those standards so that we can say well one so that I can say if I have a product that has a, a Singapore label on it that it at least as a technologist who does this kind of research, I can at least say, well, it satisfies this three quarters of the NIST guidelines or, or something, you know, I don't know what the actual percentage is that I look, but like, so the idea is so that you can use one set of standards, the satisfaction of one set of standards as a shorthand for the satisfaction of a subset of another. Um, and so, um, as companies start doing it, they can say, well, we need these 10 things for Finland and half of the US. And, and then like, and, but then they're halfway there, right? Uh, by, by fulfilling the standard for Finland, uh, uh, if the ratio is one half, they're, then they're already halfway there. And then, so it's not twice as hard for them to then meet a stricter standard elsewhere. So the idea is having these standards in other places, um, another example is, uh, where the EU has pushed market changes is they started requiring uh, standardized cell phone adapters. And that is what, like, secretly, that is what pushed uh, every cell phone having its own kind of plug to everything being USB. Yeah, I feel like, you know, they're having a more global approach to some of this makes sense. The sort of, you know, rising tide lifts all boats of certain, I live in California, um, having higher regulatory standards than either other countries or other areas of the same country. I think one of the things that sort of I have noticed both in the questions we're receiving and this conversation is um, thinking about the relationship between um, companies and external evaluators. So, you know, sometimes there seems to be a lack of trust around companies evaluating themselves or self-reporting their security features because, you know, there have been situations where I think consumers have felt misled, um, you know, some FTC enforcement where, you know, we have been told that a router or a, um, you know, communication platform is more secure in certain ways that it turns out not to be. Uh, but it seems that like in both Finland and Singapore, it is self-reporting. Um, you know, there isn't an external evaluator. Uh, yeah, that is the case as far as I understand it. It's just, it is self-reporting. And that's certainly the case with the uh, French Repairability Index. Yes. Um, but uh, yeah, um, I think that the, that that is part of the, that so we do need to, we will need to rely a certain amount on self-reporting because as just mentioned, we don't know, we, there's really no good, I mean, this is a large problem with evaluating any internet service provider is you don't know what, like who their servers are talking to um, and who they're, it's really hard to audit data, backend data sharing. Um, so there's, you're never going to escape all of the trust questions, but I do think that, um, you can move towards a space where manufacturers are certifying that their product does something, and then you have other organizations that can come in and do some of that spot checking, not dissimilar to like auto crash testing or something like that. So automakers will do their own crash testing and then consumer reports and other people like that will, and other, and other testing insurance, the national insurance testing group or whatever it's called, will, um, I'm sure I got that name wrong, um, uh, will, uh, you know, randomly buy these cars and crash them themselves. Um, so I think that, that moving towards that kind of an ecosystem, which is this kind of like a mix of self-reporting and spot checking, um, because I don't think, um, you know, I, honestly, you know, that's, there's not the ability to just test every revision of every product as it comes off the shelf because there's just too, too many, the, the, the fire hose is too powerful. Um, and so you just have to sample it and hope you're catching enough of a representative sample. 
Well, I appreciate it. I, I wanted to give each of you an opportunity to sort of come around and if there's any final thoughts you'd like to share or any next steps you'd really like to um, draw the eye of listeners uh, toward. Um, Kat, do you want to, if there's anything else on this behalf that you think that would really should be aware of or sort of that you would like to share with us? Um, no, I mean, I think we, I think we touched on everything. Again, I, I encourage everybody to submit a contribution. Um, I do want to say, um, you know, especially being a cybersecurity uh, you know, professional, we do tend to focus on kind of the, the, the problems with cybersecurity. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, what we really want to see is we want to see IoT adoption kind of as, as broadly adopted as possible because we recognize the benefits and the immense benefits that IoT can bring. And, you know, lately I've, I've been talking a little bit kind of about the, the strategic vision of IoT. And if you think about it, um, you know, AI is one of the big topics that's kind of on the horizon that it's talked about as, as well that has, you know, some things that need to be worked through. But, um, you know, IoT is really going to be the mechanism through which a lot of the data and a lot of the information that is going to be used by a lot of these AI systems is, is, is going to be needed. And then a lot of these AI systems are actually going to leverage IoT in order to actually um, implement the decisions that the, the, the AI uh, kind of produces or, or the outputs of the AI. Um, so we, we do have another effort going on at the Department of Commerce. Uh, it was in the NDAA of 2021. Um, and uh, the Department of Commerce was directed to stand up a, uh, an IoT steering committee uh, consisting of non-governmental stakeholders. But the focus of this IoT uh, steering committee is really to look at what are the barriers to adoption uh, across kind of the U.S. Uh, where are there potential kind of like regulations in place or programs or policies that might actually be inhibiting the growth of IoT? Um, you know, if you think about it, what we really want to do is we want to make sure there are no barriers. So um, unfortunately, the nominations for what we call the IoT FACA, uh, which is the Federal Advisory Committee uh, under which the, the, the structure of the steering committee is being established. Um, unfortunately, that closed yesterday, so it's a little late to ask for nominations. That being said, though, uh, we will be inviting people to come in and actually speak to the IoT FACA, FACA. Um, I anticipate over the next year, it is going to be resulting in a uh, report that goes to the federal government, to a uh, working group, an interagency working group, and ultimately is going to result in two reports that are going to be going to Congress with some recommendations. So um, for those of you who are interested and passionate about IoT, I encourage this as kind of another area for you to follow as well, uh, because there might be opportunities as well there to yeah, you know, talk about the role of cybersecurity. I'm actively involved in it because I feel that um, we really need to address the cybersecurity issue if we really want to recognize the potential of IoT. Um, because I think the uh, the first time something really, really, really bad is going to happen, the chilling effect on the market is, is potentially there, and we may actually set back adoption significantly. Um, so, thanks for the opportunity again to to speak and talk to your community. Of course. And Justin, from your perspective, as someone who, you know, works deeply on consumer issues, um, as we move forward in this sort of what should a label look like, who should implement it process, you know, what would do you think we should really, you know, keep an eye on? Yeah, I think I'll follow up on something that said that it does have to be a combination of, um, you know, mandated transparency information provided by companies. Um, they should be probably legally required to make more information available than they have today. But I think third party testing and third party auditing is going to be essential. And, and there are actually legal impediments to that today. Sometimes companies will put in their contracts like you're prohibited from publishing tests about us or you have to talk to us first so we get a hearing. Um, the DMCA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, like we talked about black boxes, like it makes it makes it illegal to look in the black box. Um, you know, sometimes, um, like, you know, I think back to the um, NYU Ad Observatory, which is a, a system that was looking at Facebook and looking at their political ads and trying to figure out how they're targeted. 
Facebook didn't like it, so they cut off the API. And so I think we're going to need some more mandates and more clear mandates around data security. We're also going to probably need some more mandates around um, external auditing and transparency. And so, you know, there's something, there's some elements of that in Europe with the Digital Services Act. Um, my colleague Laurel Lehman was testifying this morning um, on, on some of the bills in the House Energy and Commerce Committee on transparency from Representative Trahan. So I think we're going to need some some more elements like that too in order to to we're going to need a little bit of everything to hold this uh, this place the ecosystem more accountable. Yeah, for those who want external testing and you know feel like external organizations and security experts should be part of this holding companies accountable aspect, I would raise, you know, something OTI has done significant work on is DMCA reform, CFAA reform, you know, there are legal impediments that bar security researchers right now from some of the types of research that we see as extremely valuable and important. And unfortunately, that's often because companies are hostile to this type of research. There's not, you know, as great a relationship like an interdependence on seeing the value of external evaluation and research. Um, but I, I do think I agree with Justin, it needs to be sort of a multi pronged process with a lot of different actors who come together to make sure that we're doing this right. Um, Nat, did you have any as our, you know, OTI technical expert who's been, you know, mostly involved in this, anything you sure. want to close out with? Sure. Um, I, I, I do want to echo that there is a lot of good policy movement in the correct direction. The uh, Tra Trahan bill that's going through the House right now is actually very has, has a lot of interesting stuff about you know more more about the like larger internet platforms and the information they have to provide. But it's it is a very good piece of legislation in terms of like understanding the research requirements of, and the public interest requirements of. Uh, of uh, the modern internet age. Um, and then another uh, example of good policy moving in the right direction is the uh, 2021 round of temporary exemptions to the DMCA. So the DMCA has a provision where the Librarian of Congress certifies a set of uh, exemptions to the DMCA. And the last several rounds have seen an expanding exemption for uh, security research. Um, and while not perfect, there's a lot more clarity than there used to be around what you can and can't, uh, what parts of the black box you can look into and uh, what you can do once you've pried it open. Um, uh, but again, there's, there's work to be done there. Um, and then the other thing I want to come back to is, is uh, part of the uh, NIST guidelines towards uh, the notion of schema owners and and um, how that's well in my head plays into the idea of the of like this kind of ecosystem of third party testers and how to uh, one of the next pieces of work is like incentivizing people to pick up being schema owners and to think about like who it is we talk to to get that work to happen like do we like like and how do we think of the like overlap of schema owners. Like, do we prefer, you know, is it more useful to have a schema owner that's thinking about lighting and light bulbs? Or is it more useful to have schema owners that are thinking about child safety and children's products? Or is it a both and? Like, do, you know, do, do we want, you know, one, one schema owner to think, as their like primary set of outcomes to be just centered around what do parents want to know, or what what are we you know what, what does this you know what does our child safety IoT label mean like what set of values does it represent, um, as opposed to just like the like does this light bulb do these things or not, like does it check the boxes and you know both are very useful. Um, and 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 again, it's very I uh, it's helpful because you want to think about like the outcomes and the consumers here when when doing the labels. And so uh, thinking broadly kind of about schema owners in that sense too, it's like who, you know what the the, the kinds of labeling scheme that consumer reports might come up with might be different than the kind that like, some you know building maintenance association comes up with for like you know thermostats yeah 
so thanks everybody i, I really, agree with you oh i'm sorry kat did you have any final thoughts on nope. what no, I, was, I was just going to respond to justin yeah um i completely agree i think you bring up two very good topics please do submit comments justin um but the governance around multiple scheme owners is indeed something that we recognize and and, and we touch on and then profiles um is something that we also recognize and i i could have talked even longer during my intro but um that's one of the reasons we decided not to look at tiers straight out of the gate because we felt how can we ask the consumer to make the risk decision and select which one of the tiers are appropriate for the risk associated with the device uh, but we rather would see these profiles kind of emerge from the market and say right for baby monitors we may have to adapt this profile to be appropriate for baby monitors because the risk of a baby monitor is maybe slightly different than the risk associated with, I don't know, my my connected uh, tire inflation pump, uh, you know, that's connected to my phone. So um, just wanted to respond to it. It was too, too tempting to jump in there. Thanks, Andy. Thanks so much, Kat. So I wanted to flag that uh, my colleagues at OTI comms, if you go to Twitter at OTI, are going to put up the link to the NIST comment opportunity. Um, if someone has strong opinions and would like to share that helpful expertise before March 15th. Uh, also, if you would like to um, you know, participate in any other IT Mod Week events, it goes till Friday. Uh, the website is itmodweek.com. And I know there's a lot of interesting community events. Another one that is a New America event, but also you know, on a wide range of things. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining us. We really appreciate um, you know, NIST uh, giving us this opportunity to ask questions and learn a little bit more about where your process stands, but also um, Justin and Nat, thank you for joining to provide you know those other perspectives and both technical and um, legislative and regulatory expertise. So thank you, everyone. I hope you have a lovely Tuesday. And please uh, continue to follow the discussion around IoT security at OTI on Twitter. Thanks, everybody.